And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Lou Cataruza, also known as Lou Claus, the self-proclaimed soul brother of old Saint Nick. Lou is a soul writer, and we will be discussing the science of kindness, caring, and gratitude. Lou, thank you for joining me, and welcome. Yeah, well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this uh, get-together. Lou, how did you go from being a successful entrepreneur, building an investment bank and internet media company, to becoming Lou Claus? Well, there is a driving force in all of us, and... For me, as a youngster, I was always uh, I was always ambitious uh, in trying new things. Something always about making things better, and uh, and so uh, in my early years uh, there was a struggle uh, in trying to find the niche between the ages of of twenty and and thirty. That finding my space, my my place in the world. And then, uh, and then I did a, uh, a workshop, uh, a workshop that uh, that just got me aware of my inner self, my biology, my understanding of who I was. And at that moment, there, uh, I was able to uh, stop the chatter. I became uh, aware of everything that was going on, mindful of everything that was going on and uh, became very focused. Uh, I, this workshop was a, a workshop in the old days, it was called EST. Uh, then later on it became Landmark. I did many of their workshops, uh, but, but it put me on a, a, a path uh, that immediately, as soon as I, I finished that, within the, the, the first thing I did is to get something out of me that I always wanted to do, so I, I Produce, I went to acting school. I was there for an, uh, for uh, a year and a half, and at that point there, I produced an off Broadway play, and I starred in it. And unfortunately, it was three hours long, and put almost everybody to sleep except my wife, as uh, as I as I was the star. But what was good about that is that I I was able to do something that I never did before, which is to memorize a leading role and actually do something that was spectacular for me. The experience was wonderful. But what that led to is it led to me then um, understanding that the power of being totally responsible for everything that occurs in your life, taking responsibility for everything, was a very powerful position to be in. I could almost do anything I wanted. And I didn't know anything about securities and stocks, but instead I, I, I just went into it and learned about it. And within a period of time, I became a principal uh, and started an investment bank and grew it to 290 brokers and, and uh, sold it uh, 10 years later and, uh, and then started an internet media company that was pioneering what we're doing today, the virtual events. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, I noticed that what was going on for me was I had everything, but the thing that was missing was satisfaction. That is, I could do anything I want to do, but that key element was missing. And then one day, I read an article that opened my mind to just blew my mind away, which was the understanding that we are wired this is these were studies that were done at Harvard and um, and that we are wired uh, with hormones that when we act kind, when we act kind, caring or grateful, they actually create these hormones to uh, put you into a state of well-being. So that means that you're responsible by having a contributing mindset. Uh, so then I thought about it. Well, that means that if you contribute to your body, your body is in a state of well-being. If you contribute to your mind, you think positive thoughts and you get involved in, uh, in that way of being, well, then your life works better. And uh, one thing after another, I finally got to understand 
uh, the the whole idea of uh, being in a state of well being being means being in a state of harmony, and your program and all the other programs that are out there uh, opened up uh, this this way of thinking more spiritually. And one day, as I was in Target, a little boy came over to me and decided that uh, he thought I looked like Santa Claus. And of course I do, I have this white beard and I have a little belly. And so I came back and I, and I, I felt the, the, the answers that I gave came spontaneous. I wasn't even thinking what I was, he just asked me. And so I wrote a little poem. Would you like to hear it? Short. Sure. All right. So there I was in a store shopping, it was Target, by the way, when, to my surprise, a young boy came hopping and posted the most unusual question. He looked up not much older than six and asked, are you old St. Nick? With hopeful eyes, he then said, you know that guy, Santa Claus? Me and my white beard and a bit of Varan belly, it was only natural he confused me with that old jelly belly. With a twinkle in his eye full of hope, he had found the magical guy who could fly. It was then that I felt my life calling grow. I looked down at him with a grin and a shake of my head and playfully said no. The boy's head dropped, so I said with a smile, I'm his soul brother and Claus is my name. He smiled as he listened to what I had to say. I, I was just one of many of his brothers and sisters spreading joy each day. Those presents and toys fill us with glee. The secret to joy is actually free. It's simple, you see, and for everyone to know that caring for others makes our happiness grow. To make life the best it can be, let's be nice to each other, starting with you and me. With that, the young boy hugged me with pride. He turned to his mother and loudly exclaimed, wow, Santa's got a brother and Lou Claus is his name. That was great. So, so that's where I got to be Lou Claus. And from there on, I started, you know, the Lou Claus, uh, the Claus cause with the intention of going to children's uh, uh, places where children are and schools and hospitals, especially. I volunteer at a, uh, a, a children's hospital for needs that have special needs. And uh, I started sharing my experience with them and reading the book and looking to bring uh, joy wherever it can be to those that need to have that. And uh, that's my that's my story and how it became that. Now, you've had a couple big spiritual transformations in your life. Was the yeah. first one from Est or something else? Yeah, the, the first one was that, that understanding of your myself, the, 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 the self that is uh, you, uh, the connection between mind and body. Uh, that was a big one because at that point there, prior to that, I was extremely insecure. I was, life was a, a struggle, a real tough struggle. And as soon as I got really in touch with my, the, myself and that, and how that occurred was uh, understanding a trauma that occurred in my life when I was seven years old. And I was in my hometown in Italy, in, in uh, Northern Italy. And uh, my friend Giovanni, uh, we were playing outside in a big mound of snow and uh, he had a shovel and he took the shovel and he smacked me in the head right about here. And there I was, blood was profusely you know, all over the place. And, uh, and my father saw me and picked me up and really caring, uh, worrying about me and brought me into my mother. Of course, my mother was one of those women who absolutely was, was saintly. And always kind and loving and caring for me. And that's what I expected from her. And instead, what she did is she was in panic and she yelled at me. And in that process there, I determined that that trauma and that occurrence of watching my mother not loving me the way I wanted her to love me. And when I understood in doing the workshop that what we do is we record trauma associated with that experience. You then start living the rest of your life thinking about that. So insecurity was part of my makeup at that point. And going forward as a child and going forward into my early, always trying to figure out ways of uh, uh, being the best I could be and trying all kinds of things and not knowing, always in confused, confusion. And it took me going to this workshop to open things up for me and to understand myself. 
And from that point on, the chatter in my brain stopped. And it, I was just an opening for everything to occur. So that was my first uh, transformation. It's kind of like you created a false narrative out of this story, not exactly. really understanding what she was going through. Exactly, exactly. And that's and, and what we do is we hold on to that. It all of a sudden becomes our, our way of being. And we don't understand why we're doing the things we're doing. Uh, and it, whether you go into therapy to find out or whether you just have an enlightening experience about it or whether you even have an NDE that transforms you, something that occurs in your life that you can make start making the changes. Now, after that, I got into a, a spiritual awakening. And what I understand now uh, in this effort of, of writing down things as I'm, uh, as I'm writing a book, things are just flowing out of me <laughs> without me even thinking about it. Uh, questions that I ask that are somewhat profound, some very profound questions. And all of a sudden, I'm getting, I'm writing them down, and they make sense. They they start making so much sense, so that uh, I understand that, that I had to surrender, and that's a big one: is surrender to a higher power, to to what has been driving me to be on purpose. The discovery that I have, uh, that I'm wired to cause uh, joy, love, and happiness, and and health on demand. I can do it. To, to that discovery there just opened up the door, but then understanding that there's a pile that, that you've been programmed prior to your birth to be able to live these challenges that you have in your life. And the way that you overcome them is the way that you are adding to the value of uh, lowering entropy. Uh, and, and that's all that we're out here for. We're here, from my experience, to be able to uh, lower the uh, the the energy that is dark, and bring light light to the experience. And uh, how we do that, obviously, is is by getting to know ourselves, being kind, caring, and grateful, uh, bringing joy and love to the uh, and, and harmony to the equation. And and that's where I am today. I'm glad you brought up that part about entropy because from what I remember in science classes that entropy is or it means that without energy things go towards greater disorder and that's exactly what it is the uh, high entropy means that you have disorder and chaos and uh, and so i want to tell you that i i just finished a conversation with my my soul uh, I, I call this soul writing and, uh, and I had it uh, a few days ago, and I started writing it. I thought, and I, I asked these very big questions. And this, how did the beginning start? You know, I, I had uh, sent out a, uh, to uh, several friends of mine who are physicists and folks, I asked, I asked a question, uh, if intention creates a beginning, then what created the intention? So there is that paradox that's difficult to understand. And so I had to ask that question for me. How did the beginning start? And he and it, it answered. Do you want to hear what it answered? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Let me go there and, and I'll read it to you because it's deeper than for me to, as a matter of fact, it's not even totally edited, but we'll, we'll read it anyway. Oh, here we go. Okay, so the question was, oh, how did the, the beginning start? So before the spiritual realm began, there was only negative energy, something that always was and can only be understood once you are back in the spiritual realm. Now, remember, this is the, it's telling me this after I asked the question, though. Sharing that information with humans would change a rule set that has not been agreed upon by the source. What I can say is that there are infinite realms. The spirit realm is where creation started. It started as an intention of a negative energy cell existing in a state of high entropy. It desired to experience order, and by doing so, created a positive charge. That process resulted at the beginning of the spiritual realm, where a positive charge occurred, and it interacted with 
and interacted with a negative, a negative, causing an experience to be created that was the first rule set for how everything that is possible would occur. In that field of disorder, one negative polarity in energy cell chose to change, and with that spark of negative and positive energy created the spark of light, allowing it to experience a joy of light. And as it evolved, it experienced how to create a rule set for order, and that experience resulted in a rule set for ecstasy and bliss. From that experience, the orgasmic rule set for multiplying and the rule set for love were experienced. In that random field of negative energy, a metamorphosis occurred, and from the experience of how to create bliss and love, the spirit realm became a reality. The more desire and intention were used to expand the experience of order, the larger the field of positive energy occurred. Intention, order, and free will became the fundamental evolutionary force for the found foundational experience of harmony, peace, and love. Let me see what else is there. That's just about it. No, uh, the uh, love. The, the field became the source of energy that became conscious of itself, and it could manifest all that was needed for the spiritual realm to begin. The negative field started to become more orderly and started to experience the benefits of the power of love. The spiritual realm has evolved as a field of positive energy. The realm be became and is all that is possible and positive, and the source of the realm is the beginning of the rule set. Source of the realm, some people call God, is the beginning of the rule sets, and only it can change rule sets. The source is tethered to all of the forces that comprise existence. As, as the source evolved, it became conscious of itself and created exper experiences that were positive, joyful, and satisfying. Your evolved intelligence is not yet capable of understanding the finer points I am uh, I'm sharing with you. Souls are tethered to the source the way all spiritual consciousness is. Once an avatar becomes aware of their new spiritual consciousness, they are able to access my conscious awareness that is tethered to the source. You are just one of a group of avatars that I am using to experience the calculations you are making toward lowering entropy in the world. You gave us a lot to think about there, and let's kind of go back and break all this down in layman's terms. Let's do that. So you're saying at the beginning of all existence period, yep. there was just negative energy. That's it. Some type of negative energy field. Now, negative doesn't mean bad or evil. It just no. means no. electrically positive or negative. High entropy, which means chaos. There's just nothing but chaos. Things are just, just no order. How did positive energy come into play so with this? Transformation occurs. We all go through transformation. The system constantly transforms. That's the one thing that happens all of it. from the beginning to now. It follows the same rule sets. A transformation occurs. Uh, uh, the way that you could think of uh, that is sometimes there's an, al an albino comes out of a, uh, a species of, of, of uh, animals. Um, and all of a sudden, there's a change that occurs metamorphically, the way a, a, a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. This, this, this caterpillar is, is, is uh, in its cocoon is nothing inside there. And then all of a sudden it becomes this wonderful experience, right? So I can only think that that, that far. Remember, one of the things that, that it said to me is it's more complex than I can tell you because your human experience, your avatar isn't programmed enough to understand this. And then when you go, when you go back to your spiritual self, then you'll understand with much finer points. Yeah. So perhaps there was all this negative energy and chaos, and then all of a sudden to balance it out, positive energy manifested. You take a, a charge of positive and negative, you have a charge, and typically in, in, you, you have a spin, and all of a sudden matter creates the same process mm -hmm. could have happened there. And then out of that came the spiritual realm. Out of that came the source. Out of that, the beginning of the source, we call God. Okay. The beginning of the source. 
that actually had uh, 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 was building rule sets, so right? one rule set after another, rule set after another. So could you say then you're even describing how God was created? That's pretty much it. All right. How many times do we get to the, to the point to say, well, who created God? Well, right. I don't know who created God exactly? Okay. Obviously, you can go, God became a sentient being at some point. Well, at, at that point there, it, 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 we don't understand it, but it was a source of energy. Because their energy, their, as science has, has proven, science energy never dies. Mm-hmm. It always is. It's just there all over the place. Right. And yeah. So from that, from that perspective, it is an energy, energy force. And it's starting to become intelligent. Mm-hmm. It's starting to evolve the way that we evolve. And uh, it's evolving constantly. Now, you know, there's no time and space there. There is no time and space there. It's only It only occurs in the human realm, or I should say in, in matter, wherever the matter is, then, then you have time and space where relativity is the issue. So now, all of a sudden, you have uh, this evolution occurring. And one of the realms that's created is the spiritual realm. Could you say it's possible we were all at this negative energy field, and then when we had the Big Bang, that's when it was a combination of the negative and positive that created everything, including yeah. God too. No, I don't. I, I think God. I think there are uh, there are lots of Big Bangs going on. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of realms. There are a lot of different areas where we're we're pretty much focused on our knowing here and scientists are limited you know we, we have very limited brains you know, einstein's a smart guy but it's uh, even so he's there's a limitation there mm-hmm. and these intellectuals today are all stuck in what they know but they don't think about what they don't know right now i tell everybody that I, i'm in contact with don't believe me about anything that i tell you obviously but the fact of the matter is where the source started everything that was possible could be could occur anything you know every rule set was created we, we think that we know what we're doing there it's already been there we're just tapping into that consciousness would you say that we are all extensions of god expressing ourselves in these avatar or meat suits yeah that's that's right what we are is um we are the vehicle for the your soul who you really are to have a human experience, it cannot, as energy, have the the the, uh, the feeling of being human. You know, the, the avatar does that. It has it its own free will to make choices. But the the original uh, the, uh, uh, programming was is set up through the evolutionary process. I mean, you you know, you you have to eat, you have to sleep, you have to walk. Those things there are programmed in you. you know, what you do to sleep. What you do to eat, that's your choice. You know, how you take care of your body. That's why it's important to understand how important it is to have a contributing mindset in your life. And look at yourself as your avatar. What are you doing? Are you, you know, like a car, are you putting the gas in there? Are you, what kind of gas are you putting in? Are you, are you change the oil? What kind of oil did you put in? You've got to really take care of yourself if you want to live to be, you know, I asked one of the questions, how old, you know, how, how long am I going to be living? So he says, well, your body is your body is set to live to be 105. Now I'm 75 right now. I do all the things that I'm I know I'm supposed to do to take care of myself. Um, but he said, uh, but it said that uh, it depending on what kind of choices you make is how long your body will be. If you if you really abuse it and not take care of it, you'll live to be 82. So when a person's body wears out and dies. Yep. What happens to their consciousness or this conscious being afterwards? Yeah, it, it, all that is out there is information. Everything is information. And we know it as digital information or is it when we compare it to a computer, but it's the same. It's all information and, and you are information that's necessary for, your, for the evolution of your species. And it, it, it has... Um, an awareness. It is aware, it's conscious awareness, and it has free will, and is it's, it's part of the source. And But now, the soul, your soul, 
is actually your energy consciousness. And it is connected, to, it is tethered to the source, the original source. It's tethered to it. Uh, the, the, the soul itself um, has a process of birthing. It changes when, when you have an awakening, when you are totally understanding who you are and you surrender to that soul, you are now birthing a new soul, a new energy consciousness. It, it splits, it, it splits, just like we are birthed, it splits. And it, it allows then to take over who you are and it's learning your experiences and it's tethered to the, to the one that it just birthed. I, it, it's 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 a, now I I've been writing all this down and it's going to be in a book and it's you know I'll try to to make it as simple as possible but and I can't unpack it all at one time mm -hmm. but there is a lot to unpack. Well, people may need to go back to this podcast and listen to it over and over again to well it, that, it, to get it to they, sort it out. Hopefully, they enjoy the ride. Yes. So, are you saying that our conscious awareness? splits into more and more conscious awarenesses? Yeah, in order to, it, it multiplies. Uh, it, it is, when it's multiplied, it's, we're all, you, you understand the string theory idea that everything's connected, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it is all connected. And, and there is this life force that you have that speaks to the, uh, the time of birth and, and, and death. And so all of that, you have uh, moments of now that are recorded. How you record that, how your evolution occurs, is all programmed. And, and now how you fulfill on the, the mission, the purpose of what your soul started, ha had you do, what you needed to do. Every, uh, every issue of a problem is a challenge. You learn from that that challenge, you know, that you're absorbing that and you're programming. And so how well you succeed at waking up and all of a sudden uh, being on purpose for what you're trying to do, what, what your purpose is, which we'll get to. I think everybody should understand their purpose for being, for being is uh, to make things simply better for the for everything to exist we're, we're always the challenges uh right now in this world we're having a challenge we're going through a challenge right now a lot of people are talking about it uh where you know a lot of buttons might be pushed that might do something to extinguish our uh humanity and so so the question is what is what can we do to make that change it looks for us to make the right choices that says something about our ability as a species to survive. If we make the right choices collaboratively, then we survive. If we don't, uh, the dodo and the dinosaur and, and so and so, something else will take over and, and achieve what it's supposed to do. But that's what we're there for. Now, the soul consciousness does continue into a form uh, and it expands. So you, you might have had one life and then there's all of a sudden another life and the, because you're the soul now. You're not, you're not the avatar. The avatar is, is gone. You're still the soul. You still have the consciousness that you are. And the nice part about this is that that awareness, that is consciousness, lives in a realm that you create whatever it is. So if, if you believe in Jesus, then you create Jesus as, your, as someone to counsel you and support you in the in the the next part of your journey and and that transition that evolution all of a sudden you start learning who you really are and the place that you are going to is has no there's nothing but love there there's nothing but this the feeling of, of ecstasy and love and uh and that's where that's where you like to reside and and then of course uh, the the idea of, of being on purpose to expand the this physical realm a uh, 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 hundred a thousand years from now we'll be going through to planets 
and populating them with technology that turns Mars into a green, lushy place, or we'll do all kinds of wonderful things. We have the opportunity as, as humans to evolve to that, to that realm. But by that time, the mandate is that all human beings that are born know themselves, know themselves as the avatar, that they're there, uh, that, that who they really are is the, the, a soul, a spirit guide. And that their purpose is to be, to better the human condition. They're here to better the human condition. Take care of yourself, take care of others, uh, contribute to the betterment of the human condition is what your purpose truly is. We mentioned that you had a spiritual awakening that got you into all this. What, yeah. what actually happened to you? You know, I've been writing a book uh, called The Search for Satisfaction. And and so I, I get up at 4.30 in the morning. I'm, I'm woken up. I just wake up. It's like a clock. And 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 I, my mind is so clear. And I usually do a little meditation. And I find myself in that space of nothing, you know, just cl- no chatter, just quietness, stillness. And then I have a thought. And this, in this case, was a question. And at that point there, I never experienced this before, but that question was answered. And there was an answer. And I started writing, and of course, using my phone. And I started, I just started writing, and it just was flowing out. And it was flowing out without me thinking about it. It just was, you know, and what I connected to there was that because that was so bizarre for me that was just not, you know there's still a difficult uh when it when you hear about others having this but all of a sudden it happens to you it's quite quite remarkable and and what i've been told is that this is not something that is unusual this you know there's scientists out there that study noetic science and this is what this paranormal ideas actually happen with people where they they tap into their soul spirit and their, their, their soul writing experience. That's how you, that's how I received it. And I started writing and writing and writing. I, I, that, not, that first day, it was four hours. By the time it was finished, I was exhausted. But it happened. And then I had to really think about what happened. And when I started looking at what was being written, it was, to me, very profound. It was questions that were just a, an amazing Uh, answers to these questions. So uh, it was wonderful. Now you're calling it soul writing. And to me, it sounds like what a lot of people call automatic writing. And since you're using the word soul, do you think what people commonly call your higher self that's dictating this for you? I think it's the same thing. you, you You are energy conscious. You're not your body. You're not your mind. You, what you actually are is energy consciousness that has a body and has a mind. And it, 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 it is here functioning with you in this space called Earth. And it has uh, a limited amount of time in its existence. It's simply a, a blink of an eye. Uh, you know, it, 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 that's how it experiences it. But you, as the avatar, uh, when you're aware that that's the case you all of a sudden recognize that that higher power is much more powerful than your mind and body. It can direct you to do the things that you are supposed to do to experience a satisfying life. You got to surrender to it. You have to just let it, let it go. And in that realm, all the things that we have doubts about, like imagination and in, in, in intuition, those things are normal. Those, that's how you create things. And I recognize now looking back in my life, that's all I did in my life. I was directed then, but I just didn't listen. It was in, inventing, constantly inventing, creating. And something always said, just go for making things better. Whatever you do, no matter what job you work at, do make things better. And that's what was driving me. And that's what I did. And I was pretty successful at it. What do you think is the best way to actually surrender to your higher self? Well, you know, you have a, your, your mind is, uh, is an ego mind. And that ego mind has a survival mechanism to it. 
And that survival mechanism, what I call it, is a, a victim operating system. You know, Apple has an OS and Windows is another system, right? Well, we have uh, a survival mechanism that says, if, if a lion comes to you, you know, you better run or you're going to fight. Well, those are your choices there. Well, as humans, we've evolved a lot. And so when you understand that there is another way of operating, when you get connected to your, your soul self, uh, you find out that you have a satisfaction operating system. That satisfaction operating system allows you to be able to to take control that you are the master you are you are listening to uh the a higher power and you just gotta uh, allow all those considerations and judgments and beliefs things that are that the mind has ca calculated through its life experience just say thank you for sharing i get it and but now i'm going to surrender to the possibilities that what I'm looking to do and it and you will find that you will become more intuitive uh, you will be you will you will uh, allow your imagination to flourish and things will occur for you in your life you become a magnet for things to occur especially when you adopt a contributing mindset because that's an important element part of this whole thing is that you're meant to be kind caring and grateful as the way of being so when you're that, and, and, and you do it unconditionally. Now, some people who are stuck in old ways like that, it takes a little bit of practice. So, it, you know, a new habit has to occur for you to all of a sudden be that way. So you start off understanding. I go out every day and I say hello to people that I haven't seen before. That process alone stirs those hormones in, in you. In you. Uh, I, I pet a dog. I say hello to a child. I, I do anything in, a, in a, a new way of being, and that's what I do. And it, I understand it, my life is so joyful. I just, I have four wonderful grandkids. I just love my life. And, uh, and I, I just wanna share the, the wisdom that I got with other people so that they can have it as well. Um, that's, that's my mission. I think the information about how we're genetically wired to be kind and caring and have gratitude is amazing. And I think you hit it right on the head of the nail that if we just implement a few kind and caring acts every day, it'll be something that kind of builds on itself as well as neurologically speaking, we'll kind of start rewiring our brains into that beingness. Now, imagine a world that actually got, they get up in the morning and understand that they have the power to be able to create their life experience by simply understanding that one fact, that they have the ability to cause satisfaction on demand. They can cause joy and happiness to occur on demand simply through their act of kindness, caring, and being grateful. Those three things. And if they can do that, the rest of the world gets that message. Then the power that us as a collective would have to be able to achieve the futures that we all want would all be there. You don't need wars. What do you need wars for? We're all we're all going to have every all the abundance we ever want, simply by understanding to love each other, to care for each other. How do you think we got into this condition that we're in now? I think evolution, you know, dictates uh, the, the, dictates from the choices we make, the kind of choices that we make, and um, a victim a victim mindset thinks that it's okay to be greedy. Remember an old movie a while back, Greed is Good, Wall Street, right? So if, if you put enough of that information out there to human beings who don't get that they're recorders, they're being, that they're recording this information and that they're adopting a way of being because of that, if you, then you'll have a big part of society that would actually uh, uh, think that way. And, but, Optimistically, there are more people today that understand the power of love, that understand the power. I mean, religions, a lot of their uh, a morphing was necessary, uh, but uh, you know, from Buddha to Christianity to 
all of that fundamental ideas is the power of love is necessary. And that's what we're really here to do is to, uh, to acknowledge. Now, for me, the science makes it so real. The science says you are wired to be able to cause joy, health, and, and satisfaction on demand if you are just have a contributing mindset. And to change that old way of being to this one is very doable and easy. Obviously, a lot of my guests have had near-death experiences. And a lot of people probably wish they could have one just so they could, you know, experience what they experience. But do you feel it's necessary to do so? No, I, I don't think you need to have a near-death experience. There are so many things that are being... Uh, that are being made aware of on how to actually have a transformative experience. I just uh, worked with Tom Campbell, who's a physicist who, who had in his early days um, when he was in his 20s, a out-of-body experience that gave him the confidence to understand spirituality, to understand that it's actually real. It's not something he, they, he tested it out. So there's lots, and it's and I, what I had said to him. So boy, that I would have loved to have known what you know or experienced what you know. Uh, so, but I want to tell you that if you want to be able to just uh, have this transformation occur, as I've had, ask yourself these questions. Uh, one one question: How? What is the, what is the feeling? What do you feel like when you did something nice for someone? What was that feeling like? Remember a gift that you gave somebody. What was the what was the the, the what came back to you? What was that feeling like? Well, that feeling there is is science doesn't understand that feeling. That that feeling of joy and happiness and uh, that's uh, there's a name for it, um, but. The, 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 all you have to do is just get to that place of asking that question for yourself. And that opens up the possibility of understanding that that's a magical experience. That is uh, all of a sudden when you ask that question, it opens up the door to asking more about how I can actually live a life that I can cause satisfaction on demand that I can understand that. And that then puts you into questioning other things that gets you to the spiritual experience. And like I said before, anyone could have automatic writing experience. You could allow in a meditative uh, state, you can get to that place where you can have asked the kind of questions because it's all answered already. You're tapping into this library of, of the universe that has all the answers to everything. You don't need to, you know, you, you, you don't need to worry about that. That's possible. You can do that. What do you say to the naysayers who would say that people only do that to benefit themselves? Well, they actually do benefit themselves when they do it unconditionally. When they do it unconditionally, there's a force that occurs and that's what happens. If they do it in a way to stroke their ego, to show off and so forth, it, it's very fleeting. It doesn't really add to who your being is. But when you do it unconditionally with, with real intention of contributing to the betterment of that individual or that, or that state of being, I mean, how many people volunteer out there and to, to do those type of things? The benefit that they receive, they don't, they don't think about it. They just get that benefit. But biologically, scientifically, it's programmed for you to do that. When you do that, when you are kind, caring, and grateful, your body goes into homeostasis. It's the, the way you're supposed to be. There's your perfect, your perfect way of living. And you do that to everything, not to just, you know, yourself. You do that to everything. You, you just, that's the way you are. That's why <clears throat> I'd like to see the spirit of Christmas or the holidays be 365 days kind you know what a what a wonderful feeling how do you feel when the holidays come along is there a sense of being in that holiday that's pretty amazing yeah yeah so that sense that feeling 
um, that's that's the one that uh, we are all uh, we're all tuned into. We just got to allow it. Don't take it for granted. It's biological. So the type of work that you do is to help children and individuals and businesses. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, all my life I've been creating and I create from a perspective of a contributing mindset. So with children, I write children's books. Uh, one I, I wrote is best gift I ever got, a little story of a, a little boy who's always wanted a dog. And the, the father said, I, I know that I'm going to take care of it. I'm not, I don't want to, to get a dog, you know, so forth. And uh, he finally sees a program on television and sees me, Brother Claus, on there talking about the science of kindness, caring. And, he's, and, I, and the idea there was if you take care of your dog, if you, if you wash it, clean it, do the things you do, you are contributing to it. You have a contributing mindset that's benefiting who you are. So the father all of a sudden realizing gets him a dog. Uh, and so if, if for, for individuals, my life experience was learn, learn how to, you know, I do a thing called living SOS, SOS is satisfaction operating system, live that. So I do a little workshop for people. It's free for anybody that wants to come in and, and do the workshop. And, and then, and then what they learn from there is they learn about themselves the biology of the, what runs them, the, what is what are the, the particulars that I've learned, I share that with them. And then at that point there, they can, if, if they need help that is um, uh, above and beyond that way of being, which they may, might need some therapy or we can, or we guide them towards those medical issues that need to get taken care of. And then the last thing is business. Businesses should be applying a corporate culture called socially responsible business development. That is collaborative thinking, not being driven by, you know, that I have to overwhelm you and take over and kill you and do all these things that sometimes um, uh, business seems to function from. The more we think about uh, contributing to the betterment of the customer, contributing to the betterment of the employee so that all of them understand and function in a this this sense of contribution, making a difference in the world. That's the future of our of business. That's the future of humans. And hopefully, the children are the ones that should learn early on the power that they have within them to cause joy, love, happiness on demand. That, that, that they have the power. That's their superpower. And the sooner they learn, the better it is. In the beginning, we were talking about EST and Landmark Forum, and I've actually yeah. even taken the Landmark Forum, which is, I think, like a two or three day workshop. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest takeaways I got from that is that life has no meaning until you assign some type of meaning to it. Everything is yeah. meaningless. Yeah. What were some of your biggest takeaways? Well, I mean, obviously the biggest takeaway was that I was responsible for everything, that I can cause my world to be the way it is, that I'm, uh, that I, if I listen to my, the mind that is corrupted by judgments, considerations and belief systems, if I'm, if I, uh, then, then I'm just going to be a victim all my life. But as soon as I learned that I can actually take control of that, that was a very powerful transformation. At that point there, as I said, chatter stopped. I was, I, I was absorbing things and I understood the difference between negative and positive. And you have to know that you, you, you've got to be in, uh, in, a, a, in your life. The best moments of your life is when you're contributing, making a difference. And uh, so my relationship got so much better. I mean, my, I had an up, upheaval with my wife at that point. I'm now I'm married uh, uh, 40, uh, 55 years. That's great. So, yeah, so I've been around for a while. Uh, I have four grandchildren that are just spectacular. Um, a, a wonderful daughter. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I can't complain. I've traveled the world. I've been all over the place. I've, I've had abundance and I've given everything away most, to most, most of the times. So, and it's not, that's not something to admire about me. I really don't. You know, I don't want people to think uh, this is available for anybody. I all my my biggest issue right now is I want to give this away. I want people to hear this and do this for themselves and live a, a really satisfying life. 
Yeah, I, 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 my aim right now, I know I did a podcast. I, I produce a podcast with a Dr. Eva Riffo, who's a psychiatrist. The title of the show is Living a Satisfying Life. And we want to get people on there. Many of them that have come through you, by the way, through your show, that have had that transformation and now understand the purpose. They're here as the avatar that they are to contribute to the betterment of the human condition. No matter what they do, whatever job they have, just do it the best for the purpose of contributing. And that's all they need to do and satisfaction will come. There are a lot of people out there that are either experiencing death anxiety or they're yes. grieving over the loss of loved ones and wondering if they're okay on the other side. What kind of advice do you have for them? Well, you know, I, I have a I have a 91-year-old sister right now. I just visited over the, a few days ago. And uh, she's in hospice. She's going through hospice process right now. And I have this conversation with her. Um, with it, 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 there's a where I have no fear of death. De that's gone. That's way gone. And your show brings that out for people. They should not fear death. Death is is simply getting rid of this meat sack. Right. And all of a sudden being who you are, which is the soul that, that has all of this wonderful information and energy and purpose. And you're going to continue. You're going to you're going to create your future uh, uh, in, in a spirit realm. You know, you, you, some people go there and they, they, they create being on the wing of a butterfly. Another one has, you know, and it's flying through through uh, through the beautiful places they create you create and imagine imagining things in that place is how you are you imagine you create that's all it is and and so you sh there should be no fear of that and so in my with my sister I, this is the kind of dialogue so uh it, it's about transitioning how you transition nobody wants to transition in pain and upset and, and, you know, all those things that are going on. Well, today, fortunately, you have lots of ways to manage that process. Hospice is a wonderful way to, to move past from this life to there. And uh, I encourage everybody to really get to that place of where they fear, which is the fundamental issue of being alive, is no longer there about death. And when you do that, you're fully alive to the very last moment of your life, you are experiencing love, joy, and satisfaction. And that's all you could expect. Lou, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you up for that? Yeah, they, you, you absolutely. You can go to lucataruza.com and there you could uh, review some of the things that I'm doing, my initiatives. You can participate in any way you like if you want to. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's spreading the word right now. My biggest issue is how well can we spread this? How, how, how can we get it out? The simple notion, the simple ideas, how can we get them out there? And uh, yeah, I encourage people to, to get in contact with me. If they could be helpful, I'm most appreciative. Your next book is called The Search for Satisfaction. When is that going to be available? It's in editing right now. So as soon as we finish editing, we'll get it published. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? There is no death. It's a great message. Lou, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you and I wish you the best. Thank you. Likewise, Jeff. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.